Elijah. There was a great prophet, Elijah. Uh, but Elijah got discouraged. Elijah got depressed. You mean prophets get depressed? You mean preachers get discouraged? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, and so Elijah, whose prayer life, now I want you to remember this, his prayer life was so powerful that he prayed and God stopped the rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again and the rain began to come again when God's people turned to God. So here's the man who prayed even the weather to stop raining and to start raining. But in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4, look at that last phrase. It very simply says that Elijah got discouraged, he got depressed, and he said, Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Now, that verse, in that verse, he's praying that God would kill him. Sometimes if you ever ask God, God, just take me home, just kill me, just take me out of here. Aren't you glad he doesn't always answer your prayers? He says, Lord, just kill me. He said, my life here on this earth is not worth living. Did God answer that prayer? No, God denied that prayer. And yet here was the man who prayed and God stopped the rain. He was the man who, 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 who prayed and God sent the fire upon that altar on Mount Carmel. And yet here was a prayer that he prayed and God said no. God said no. He actually prayed in verse 4 that God would kill him. And that God denied that request of a man who could pray and stop the rain. Yet God told him no. The request of Elijah to die was wrong because that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't God's will. He was asking God to do something that was not in God's plan for his life. In fact, God had something better for Elijah if he just waited. Amen. Had something better for him. Just hang on. I want you to remember that thought because sometimes God's denials, when God says no, God's denials to our prayer many times is an act of love toward us because he actually has something better than what you're praying for. Amen. That brings me to the second thing. And that is this. What do you do when God delays the answer? What do you do when your timing is wrong? God will delay the answer to that prayer. The Bible teaches something very specific in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Now I want you to notice uh, this about prayer. Faith has a trust element. Amen? It has a trust element. You trust God. It has a trust element. But... It also has a time element, a time element. Many times our kids would say, I want that toy. And we say, no, not right now. Maybe Christmas was just around the corner. And we say, no, not now. And they scream, please, I just got to have, you know, and they go out of the store and everybody think we had one of our children who went out of Walmart screaming, don't beat me, don't beat me. <laughs> that gets everybody's attention. But the reality is that sometimes we pray and God delays because he has something even better for us. God isn't the habit, in the habit of bending his agenda to fit our agenda. Amen. We think we really need it. We think we really want it. That ought to be reason enough for God to give it to us. And because the preacher said on TV, just ask and God will give you everything, including a Rolls Royce. Just ask him. If you don't get a Rolls Royce, you're not really saved. You know, they tell you, that's that name it, claim it philosophy of so many. The reality of it is God has a timetable. God has a timetable, but faith has a trust element and a time element. You ask God, God has a special time when he answers that prayer. But I want you to understand, your faith has to be in trust to God, not to heap it on yourself. Trust God to know what to do and when to do it, a time element and a trust element. The second thing I want to say is that when your timing is wrong, God will delay. If I had a little three-year-old and he wanted a shotgun, it might be perfectly okay one day to give him a shotgun, but not when he's three. 
So God will answer your prayer if it's in his will, but he has the right time. Listen, folks, God may not be saying no to you. He might be saying not now. Terry and I prayed for two years before we came here to be your pastor. Two years. May I say to you, God has a time element. I want you to look with me at Isaiah chapter 30 for just a minute. Here's a great verse for you to remember. A great verse. What I want to say here is that God's delays are not always God's denials. So many times we get upset with God because he doesn't do what we say when we say do it. But God's delays are not always his denial. Sometimes the timing just isn't right and God says, wait, I have something better for you first. Amen. I have something for you so you can grow into that. I have something for you that you can get ready for the answer to prayer. And he says in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, therefore, will the Lord wait Will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you? And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you? For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait on him. Now, sometimes we have a longing in our heart for God to answer a particular prayer. But God puts it off. He delays the answer. Let me say that God's delay in answering your prayer are always, always, always for your good. Amen. His delays are always for your good. Remember we talked about Elijah? Elijah was a great example. Elijah said, oh, Lord, just kill me. Take me out of here. I don't want to have to go to the office tomorrow. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going out in the yard and eat worms. Did y'all ever sing that with your kids? Long, skinny worms, fat, juicy worms, and, and on and on it goes. So many times people just say, I'm going to eat worms. God doesn't love me. Nobody really won't answer my prayer. Listen, folks, this is important. I want you to remember Elijah. God said, I am not going to kill you. He said, God, kill me right now. I've had it. Just take me out of this life from this earth. I want to end it all. But God isn't answering that prayer. He didn't kill him. Do you know what happened to Elijah later on? Let's go a little further down the line. Elijah didn't have to die because there came a time in Elijah's life when he went on to be with the Lord and never died. Amen. Now think about it. I thought about that this week. Sometimes when you get to the point, you say, well, I just wish that I could just end my life. I just wish I could just stop living. I just wish I didn't have to get up in the morning. And I got to thinking, you know, wouldn't it be sad if God ended your life because you prayed and you asked him and God takes you on into heaven because if you know, be absent from the body, he's present with the Lord. And he takes you on out, you get to heaven's gate and he says, all right, let's go back. We've got to pick everybody else up. Here's the rapture. <laughs> you went on to heaven, but you missed the rapture. I want to be here when that happens. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. I want to be here when the upper taker comes. Wouldn't it be sad? God says, all right, come on home. And now get your boots on. We're going back down again. I want to be here when he comes. Now, folks, listen. Wouldn't you rather be in the rapture than to just end your life? I believe I would. You're going to be with the Lord either way. That's a theological truth. But Elijah prayed that God would kill him. No, Elijah you aren't going to get out of it that way. Why? God sometimes, there's something better than this. One day God said, Elijah, I want you to take Elisha, who's going to be your follower. And I want you to put a mantle on him. And I want you, and, and, and I'm going to take you home after you get Elisha ready. They went down to the River Jordan. And Elijah took the mantle, that's the prophet's cloak that represents the leading and the filling, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he spread that mantle. This all happened after he prayed to die. He spread that mantle on the Jordan River and the Jordan River uh, dried up and they walked across, he and Elisha. And then Elijah took the mantle and put it on Eli uh, Elijah. Elijah put it on Elisha. And God says, Elisha, I'm going to double in you what Elijah was able to accomplish. 
And they looked up after God said that, after Elijah had put the mantle on him, after he had walked with Elisha across the dry Jordan River. And I've been to the Jordan River. That's a pretty good sized river. And they walked across that river. And when they got on the other side, he did what God told him to do. He walked across on dry land. And about that time, Elisha says, hey, what's that? And a chariot of fire was coming down. What a great exit. Elisha said, just in my life, just kill me, just take me home. I don't want to go through another day. But he went on and God didn't answer that prayer. God showed him great and mighty things. They looked up, there was a chariot, a fiery chariot in the sky. And Elijah was taken up into glory. He didn't even have to die. Amen. God took him on and he didn't die. Beautiful picture of the rapture. He never saw physical death. You know, when the prophets in the school of the prophets, which was the seminary of that day, looked over to Elisha and said, hey, let's get our stuff. We got to go out in the wilderness. A beast might have him. He might be lost. We got to find him. We got to bring him back. Elisha said this. He said, no need to search him out. No need to send out a search party. He's gone on to glory. You're going to look, but you're just not going to find him. Folks, one day you're going to come looking for me if you get left behind. And you're not going to find me. You're not going to find me. I'm not going to be here. I will have been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The trump of God shall sound. The voice of the archangel shall be heard. And I'm going to be called out in the twinkling of an eye. That's one fiftieth of a second, Amen. medically speaking. And I'm not going to be here. And I hope you're not going to be here. But we will not see death. We'll be called up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Your body is going to be transformed to be like the bodies, along with the bodies of those that have already gone to be with the Lord. Their bodies will be transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, God had something better for Elijah than just to die and to be buried in a grave. God was going to send a chariot for him. That was worth waiting for. Suppose you're ready to give up, quit. And all of a sudden, there's great revival that would come to the church and you'd say, boy, I sure am glad I didn't quit. So many times we get to that point. I thought about Abraham this week. How Abraham had learned that faith not only has a trust element, faith has a time element. Abraham said, Lord, I've been waiting for you that for that heir that you've promised me for so long, so I'm just going to go over and I'm going to make it happen with my handmaiden." God said, that's not the one. I told you I had an heir for you. I know you're 100 years old. And I know your wife's over in the corner and she's laughing about the whole thing. But I've got a better way. And God gave him what he had prayed for. Listen, the mark of a mature prayer, a prayer that is mature, is being able to wait on God to answer that prayer the way God intends to answer that prayer and feel that God's delays are not God's denials. Sometimes the request is wrong. There's a wrong motive. Sometimes the timing is wrong. And God says not yet. Notice when your course is wrong, when, when you're going in the wrong direction, God may have a different plan. I thought about Jonah this week. Jonah's a great example of this. I want you to remember that Jonah got off course. God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, not in this life. And he took off, caught a ship going exactly in the opposite direction. Not to Nineveh, but to Tarshish. And he got on that boat. And as he got out in the middle of the water, the great storm came. And finally, the sailors were, were seeking God's advice as to what the problem was. And Jonah comes up from underneath and he says, it's me, guys. I'm a stinking, rotten, sinning preacher. And so the guy said, he, they, he said, throw me over and you'll be okay. You never read in the Bible where he ever touched the water. Try it. He got, they threw him over and before he even touched the water, a great sea monster. We always say whale, but the Bible uses the word to describe a special created being, a created creature. Grabbed him in midair and took him to the bottom of the ocean. 
Interestingly enough, he's such a stubborn preacher, it took him three days to pray. Now that's stubborn. As soon as I went across that creature's tongue, I'd have been praying, wouldn't you? At least I would hope I would. But he wanted, Jonah wanted, didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel message because he knew they were going to repent and he didn't like the Ninevites. He hated them. They were cruel people. He wanted God to destroy them, not forgive them. So he went in the opposite direction. And Jonah, when he was swallowed by that giant creature, that giant fish that God sent his way, in chapter 2 of Jonah, the first three words says, Then Jonah prayed. After turning against God, after praying that the Ninevites would be killed, after asking God to do something that wasn't in His will, after rebelling against God and going exactly the opposite way, when, when Jonah was swallowed by this creature, then Jonah prayed. He didn't pray when God spoke to him the first time. He didn't say, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. He went down to Tarshish in a ship and he was cast into the sea. He went down into the sea and he went down into the fish's belly. Do you notice if you read that story, Jonah went down, down, down. Anytime you get out of God's will, it's always a down progression down and when he got as low as he could go when he got as low as he could go the rest of that verse says then Jonah prayed unto the Lord and his God out of the fish's belly you know there are those situations when God has to allow us to get into the belly of a fish and almost to the place of death before we ever look up and speak to Him about the situation, before we ever change the course of our life, before we'll ever steer our life in the direction that God really wants. I wrote this and I want you to, I want you to jot it down. I want you to remember it. I want you to keep it close. Trouble causes us to re-examine our priorities and put our lives back on course when God's will, with God's will and God's purpose. Now I want you to remember something. Many times when our course is wrong, God uses trouble to direct us. That's been true in my life. How about you? And I always say, well, I'm doing God's will knowing full well I'm not. God uses trouble to put me back on course. Now remember this. You didn't change. You don't change when you see the light. You change when you feel the fire. So folks, it's an important point. Jonah didn't change just because he said, God, you're right. Jonah didn't change when he knew what God was saying was, was to be the will for his life. He began to change and to call on God, not when the ship was in the storm, not when he was flying through the air, not when the great big fish came up out of the water, not even when the fish started swimming to the bottom of the sea. He changed after three days when God didn't let him out. Then he began to see the light. He began to see that God's way was the only way. So we have to examine our lives sometimes. We have to say, is this a stone wall that I keep hitting? Heaven seems to be closed to me. The direction that I want to go seems so difficult. It seems like everything's going wrong. Is God closing this door? Is He trying to redirect my steps? I think it takes time. I think it takes patience. I think it takes prayer to find out exactly what God's doing in your life because sometimes the devil comes along just tries to discourage you and you are in the center of God's will. Our faith is tried and there's trouble and we have to ascertain whether God is working in our life or whether Satan is trying to keep us from following God's plan. There are other times when just like Jonah we say, no, I didn't have, 
I don't have a willing heart. I don't have a willing and surrendered spirit. And that's the thing that we have to examine. Is our heart surrendered to the will of God, no matter what it might be? Is our heart surrendered to the plan of God, no matter what it might be? We have to re-examine the priorities in our life. And we have to see if Jesus Christ is truly first, no matter what it costs, no matter what it seems, no matter where it takes us, is Jesus first. If you're going in a direction and Jesus is first in your life and you manifest uh, uh, you manifest obedience and surrender. You cannot make a mistake, no matter the cost. God will give you the power. He'll give you the strength to overcome and keep going in the direction that God wants you to go because the direction that He wants you to go is the direction in which He will supply your strength, no matter what the cost. Amen. No matter what the cost. If you examine your heart, and you find secret sins, or you find an unsurrendered will, or an unsurrendered heart, an uncommitted part in your life, you have to say, is being in the belly of the fish, is being lower than I am right now, the cause, and caused by a misplaced priority. If I'm not totally and fully committed to God, and His will in my life, I need to ask, is he trying to redirect my priorities? So as I pray, I do what he wants. Sometimes when our course is wrong, God's directing us and he doesn't answer our prayer because he's, if he answered our prayer, we'd say, well, I must be doing the right thing. So God withholds that answer and waits for us to come back to him, surrender to him, and give ourselves to Him, and then He answers that prayer, perhaps even in a greater way than you had thought. Sometimes when the, the prayer is delayed, it's because God is disciplining us. In Hebrews chapter 12, I want to read some verses to you that I believe will be a real blessing as we think about God's disciplining he says in verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, underline that, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof uh, all are partakers, then are you bastards, you're illegitimate children, you're claiming to be something that you're not, and you're not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now he says in verse 11, No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Folks, this is a great lesson about the Christian life. God disciplines His children. Amen. And discipline of God is a sign that you are His child. Amen. I used to sit down with my kids and I said, I'm going to spank you. Do you know why? And they could always tell me, but they still begged for mercy. Then after it was over, I reminded them, not only do I love them, but I do it because they are my child. I can't spank, spank the neighbor child, but if they're my child, it's my responsibility to love them and to show that love by not letting them do what's wrong. So we see here a very important lesson. Here's a great lesson. God dis disciplines his children. And if you're disciplined by God, it's because you're his child. If you lack discipline by God, if you can continue to live in sin, you may very well have never been saved. By the way, you can't grow without it. 
You can't grow without it. You know, salvation has three parts. Three parts. Justification, sanctification, and then lastly, glorification. And you'll remember that justification, very simply, is what you get when you are first saved. You first receive Jesus. It's salvation from the penalty of sin, just as if you had never sinned. Then there's sanctification. Sanctification is the second part. It is the power uh, or deliverance from the power of sin. You're growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It means that you are in a process of growing to be like Christ. But then there's glorification, which is another part of our salvation, which we don't have yet. You were justified when you got saved. You're being sanctified every single day, set apart, growing over the power of sin. But one day, glory, hallelujah, we're going to be even saved from the very presence of sin. There's glorification. And glorification means being saved from the very presence of sin. Now in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, Paul tells us that, that though this world, through this world process, even when God doesn't answer our prayer the way we want it answered, that He's still in the process of developing us and growing us. He says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations or glory in trials and difficulties knowing that the trials, the difficulties, work patience. Patience. Tribulation or trials work patience in us. And patience is the ability to endure under tremendous, tremendous loads. And that's why patience is spoken of in the Bible in several places. It means the ability to endure. So as you go through troubles, as you go through difficulty, as you go through trials, God is teaching you to endure. And then with that, you help those who are also needing to endure. So today, when you feel that God hasn't answered your prayer the way that you want it to be answered, the way that you want Him to, to give you what you want, you may feel forsaken. I want to encourage you with one further verse. And that is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. He says, let your conversation, that's your lifestyle, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you. So if God hasn't answered your prayer the way that you want him to answer, I want you to remember, it doesn't mean that he's forsaken you. It doesn't mean that He isn't present with you. It doesn't mean that He doesn't care about you. It may mean several things, and you have to take God's Word and examine some of those things that it might mean. But I want you to remember this. Even when God delays the answer, and He says, not now. Even when He delays the answer to your prayer, God is still speaking to your heart. Amen. You have to trust it. And you have to wait for it in God's time. God's time. How can I change my life? Next week we'll find out. Shall we stand?